a reading from the second letter of saint paul to timothy chapter 4 verses 9 onwards do your best to come to me soon for famous in love with this present world has deserted me and gone to thessalonica crescens has gone to galatia titus to dalmatia luke alone is with me get mark and bring him with you for he is very useful to me for ministry tychicus i have sent to ephesus when you come bring the clock that i left with carpus at troas also the books and above all the parchments alexander the coppersmith did me great harm the lord will repay him according to his deeds beware of him yourself for he strongly opposed our message at my first defense no one came to stand by me but all deserted me may it not be charged against them but the lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the gentiles might hear it so i was rescued from the lion's mouth god our father as we have come together as one family at st paul's bible college we implore your presence amidst us that as we go to study the pauline letters today enlighten us with your spirit of truth that being inspired by the spirit we may know your word better in the readings of the day on the fourth sunday in ordinary time you help us confront various types of rejections saint paul in his own time encountered rejection but through love overcame everything plus each of us present here that getting to know the epistles of paul may inspire us for the better that we may continue to follow you and your son more closely we make this prayer through christ our lord amen good evening everyone how are you all good evening Bye. father good evening father how are you father father good father doing well father good how is the new year good new year new year is good covid driven <laughs> new year is running oh great <laughs> good health in the new year month is come to an end today our chairman is not able to join our class so we'll begin straight away good so the topic for today is saint paul's epistles or saint paul's letters let me share my screen with you good so mr aloysius is telling the new year is a mixture of good and bad very good <laughs> <laughs> good sir so today's topic is as i said earlier paul his letters and churches so here this lesson was authored by our chairman bishop dr anthony sami peter abir and i present to you the content of this so before we proceed into understand the pauline letters let us try to have a some chat so what do you see on the screen you can unmute and talk uh, there is a pen and paper and okay envelope. on the left side then and then there is a laptop and there's a an envelope uh, sorry uh, a new mail is received ah, and very now good, there's Alicia. a mobile okay a uh, mobile and a message is received on the mobile super okay good very good thank you any other observation father is this a way of communications i okay, mean there so is old are, way of communicating of and the new ways of communicating okay so one is old way or traditional way the other one is new or modern way very good and in between laptop and mobile what happens there is a like i i actually uh, there is an ipad mobile phone and laptop so all are synchronized together so it's like a maybe uh, same ecosystem 
as they call in Mac world. Good. Which one you would prefer? And what would be the reason? <laughs> Uh, this seems to be in the new era of new technology. So, okay. as a, a humanly speaking, all of us have the attraction of using the new technology according to the new modern, uh, I mean, availability. So, I would okay. prefer the laptop and the mobile through which we could communicate easily. Faster. Okay. Yes. Uh, Victoria Sardar's opinion is that she would prefer the modern one. Very good. Anyone else? Definitely the uh, digital communication father because uh, uh, the next moment is the end of the world, <laughs> whether it is a good news or <laughs> evangelization. Okay, whatever. it reaches it reaches very fast. Very good. Um, I would prefer writing maybe one the by letter. one. So now, Mr. Alosh is. I would prefer writing the letter. Ah, it okay, is more. Prefer... It is more personal. Very it's, good, sir. Uh, it you write what comes to you okay and the one who receives the letters seeing the handwriting also he it gives him more of a personal touch very good so we can use our own handwriting while in a uh, in a email we use a ready-made font which is not which has nothing to do with our handwriting so that is one and also it use our authenticity when we write in our own hand so it proves that we have written really very good. And also, uh, there is a kind of joy. May I interrupt? Pardon? May I interrupt? May I add on to that? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, Mrs. this was. Uh, I would say it's a mixture of both. I mean, since we have the technology, why not use it? As our Holy Father Pope Francis also had mentioned, I will definitely okay. write a letter in my okay. own handwriting. Take, uh, scan it and post Super. it on the you know faster it will be and the person can see my okay. handwriting as well so it's a combination of both actually. so you would have a, you would have a hybrid type okay <laughs> so you, you write it you scan it and you send by mail very okay. super yes it's faster it will reach the person faster <clears throat> okay very good. In terms it's, it's, of we must know how to use it actually okay great ma'am image and the ode Thank you, Father. So thank you. We have Jesus, Annie, Daniel, raising hand. Uh, yes, Father. Uh, like for me, I uh, prefer now I prefer the first letter, old type of letter and writing and result because the technology only now we have. It is the written uh, format that all these years have been preserved and uh, it has been uh, nourishing us, especially the word of God and all. So technology, okay, good. Uh, next to the moment, it might go for some technical error or whatever, we we'll lose all the data. But then the written one is always, uh, you know, safe. So, I guess, of course, the latest modern technology is very easy, accessible. But then, I prefer the old uh, style to have preserved all these years when the technology was not there. So many years, the written material is being preserved. And and we are Hello. So far Hello. Yes. Okay, ma'am. Okay, good. Thank you. So maybe one last intervention, then we'll go to the next. We'll sum up. I would prefer the modern technology, Father. Uh, Father, may I speak? Yes, Mr. R.K. I would prefer the modern technology because we can keep, uh, we can preserve our, our things for a longer period without Father? much damage. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Sister. So, okay. Yes, so, so we can preserve. So, thank you, sir. Yes, somebody was calling me, Father. Father? Yes. Uh, Father, this uh, uh, mail and the laptop and the mobile, which is maybe the technology, but for us, what it remains is, it is like Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay. We cannot either ignore anything. We need okay. everything. Good. So to follow, so actually, the modern one is extension or uh, fulfillment of what has been earlier. Okay. Yes. And another important, another important advantage is the modern technology. Further, we yes, can sir. carry a lot, lot amount of data in a small uh, chip. You know. Ah, very good. So. Yeah, so, but... that is hundreds of books you can carry in one mobile. Correct. 
so now with this a... cloud computing we need not carry anything at all so that way all the more it is uh, yeah still uh, yeah it is still better yeah. hundreds of books you can carry one small chip and now cloud computing you cannot you can carry access it anywhere anywhere Sure, sure. You can carry a whole library with you, you and anywhere you can access. That is the more advantage. Very good. Thank you. But oh, perhaps, to... perhaps, yes. Father, we shouldn't forget those who are in the remote areas, who have okay. no internet connection. Mm -hmm. So perhaps we need to write to them, and the postman can deliver the letters to them. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Mrs. Lucille. Very good. So all have our own, uh, very good. So your opinions are very good. And to just quickly compare these two. So what we have at the left has its own advantages in terms of authenticity, in terms of uh, being very personal. But what we have on our right side in terms of strictness or in terms of uh, carrying feasibility, they are, they serve this better. Paul didn't have the right hand side what we have the gadgets here laptop email or cloud computing he had the traditional letter writing and even this pen was not available we'll come to that shortly they had different way of writing and which was more difficult than we do with a pen so that way we'll try to we'll try to see how paul might have uh, struggled to communicate his thoughts number two look at the picture here we have on the left this is a picture of a courier and on the right side we have a drone delivering goods for fedex so both are couriers here on the left what we have is a courier service the one of the so-called uh, they, they say it developed all in athens courier means to run or somebody who runs so a person as soon as gets a letter or something to be communicated so the person would run so that the communication reaches fast maybe in our earlier times when in our own places when we heard about telegrams so the people used to run the, the because especially we used to telegrams to communicate a new subject or loss of our beloved so that time we used to communicate through telegram and the telegram usually would run that's a courier and even earlier maybe some 30 40 years ago a priest appoint, appointment would come through a courier so uh, somebody will be sent from bishop's house carrying the appointment order so that person would be called a courier so we have it here paul surely might have used couriers so like the real persons so the real persons what is needed is there they they have to be accountable and also they have to be swift and they have to be responsible for the job that is given and in a few instances they also have to know to read and write because in some places they have to go and read the text for the people as we have in the case of jerusalem council where they send the letter and people <coughs> people go and read the letter so that way they one minute somebody's they go and read the letter by themselves so that way the courier plays a key role good but on the right side, we have today very fast way of delivering goods and we can, through this QR code, we can see where our package is. Okay? We have a lot of advantages today, but earlier these advantages were not there. Thirdly, travel. Paul and his companions might have traveled through uh, this type of boat or uh, the, the initial stages of ship where everything depended on wind. The sailing was controlled by wind. But today we are now moved towards supersonic technology where we can use even beating the gravitational force and we reach the countries that was very fast. So Paul and his companions had this moon, this means, and even the letters they reached through this means. But today we are able to communicate very fast and even we are able to represent. So in this context, we may not need letters at all because we can just go in person and present things and return to our own place within no time so here in these three pictures we have we have how we are able to see the modern and the ancient technology good 
that having said let us come to the lesson outline just i wanted to have these three pictures in mind so that we understand the world of paul better the lesson outline is as follows number 1 socio political and religious world of paul's time number 2 paul and early churches letter writing in the first century ad paul in letters background and classifications short paul in letters theological and inspirational messages of the pauline letters so in the first hour we'll see the first three parts the second hour we'll see from 4 to 6 to begin with number 1 socio political and religious world of paul's time so to see given introduction paul was a jew he was a hebrew he was a benjaminite and he was a pharisee this is how he communicates about himself in the letter to philippians like i am a jew born of a jew hebrew parents tribe by benjamin and pharisee in obedience to the law but later after his conversion he tells that he considers all these things as rubbish which means the earlier identities of paul do not have any significance once he comes up, comes to embrace jesus and from second corinthians 10 10 we have this may be true or may not be true he must be small in stature they say very very short person and even that's why that paulos saulos so paulos means small so that's how the small either in stature um, must be in stature and also uh, some writings they say he was a bald headed person and his complex was his complexion was not so appealing and the the opponents of paul actually in fact paul writes here that they criticize paul for his complexion and for his stature and this is the thing that we have learned from second corinthians 10 10 but paul comes across as a person who has great will power because that is revealed in his journey that is revealed in his mission and finally he was a learned scholar he must have been quite confident in greek and aramaic aramaic in terms of his own jewish language and greek in terms of communicative language of that time because after the hellenization uh, through alexander the great greek was a, so the so called common language but even latin was prevalent because uh, paul addresses address uh, paul is ready to address caesar and paul is addressing felix so he might have had some working knowledge about latin as well so this is how we understand his scholarly nature coming to the birth and upbringing from the scripture from the new testament and from extra biblical writings we know he was born in tarsus first his name was saul which means in the old testament we have asked of god later maybe after the influence of acts 13 9 where we have the name proconsul paulus so maybe paulus paul paul must have adopted this name from here here another thing to note theologically change of name means change of mission paul was a roman citizen and he tells in one occasion that it is not right that a roman citizen citizen be treated this way and people are afraid of having treated him very badly so only there we come to know that paul was a roman citizen and he is telling that it was his birth right then studied under gamaliel so gamaliel is one of the famous rabbis who was who were teaching law and paul studied under him and finally this one is questionable some say paul was married some say paul was not married that still the discussion is on because paul's idea of celibacy so in first corinthians 7 paul tells that they about celibacy or celibate way of living so from there we can conclude that paul was unmarried but also in other occasions like where he talks about the household codes there the text is not clear so we are not sure whether paul was married or unmarried but most likely he was unmarried they say thirdly paul the apostle apostle this word luke also gives this word and paul also uses this title for himself apostolos in greek means to be sent so paul considers himself as somebody who is sent by god and this apostle or apostleship or being an apostle comes after his vision of the risen jesus he becomes apostle to the gentiles this we have a beautiful occasion here in damascus where 
through prophet Ananias, God reveals that he will be an apostle to the Gentiles and he goes till, till the ends of the world, that is Rome. In our previous lecture, we saw Rome was considered as the end of the world. Paul is the author, documents of the early Christian communities. He has authored, that is the letters, and they form one-fourth of the New Testament. And they were written even before the Gospels were written. For example, Gospel of John was written about 100 AD, but almost Paul had finished all his writings earlier. So which means Paul had, Paul though letter writing would take time, Paul had dedicated his time for that. And from here, we get the glimpses of original Christianity. So here we need to understand from the gospels, we know we come to understand Christian faith. But from the letters, we come to understand Christian day-to-day -day living. For example, idolatry, how the Corinthian church suffered with that are dissensions like one group supporting one people another group supporting another people so these things are not mentioned in the gospels but for the these things really existed in the early christian communities and this we get we get from the letters so that way letters give us a great understanding about the original christianity and paul also is considered as a great theologian because of these theologies number one doctrine of revelation Second Vatican Council through the through the Constitution, Dei Verbum, talks about revelation. Revelation in the sense God reveals and human persons respond. So already Paul is telling his whole response as the apostle of Christ was a response, was a response to God's revelation. So his vocation becomes a response. Or in a way, today our Second Vatican Council tells our response is a faith response or obedience of faith and Paul had it really. Secondly, the very famous doctrine of justification by faith. From here, in fact, so this doctrine is found in letter to the Romans, Luther in fact takes this doctrine seriously and he tells sola fide, like the faith alone, no works. Because Paul is telling, like quoting the example of Abraham, Abraham was justified by faith and we too are justified by faith. So here we need to understand the conflict between two schools. Number one is Pauline school. Number two is James school. In James, in, the, in his letter we see how James writes, James tells that faith without works is dead. For him, faith and works, they go together. But in the Pauline school, we need to understand it's only faith alone. But we need to clarify here. So Paul is not negating our works but Paul is negating the works of the law. So we need to differentiate, otherwise we'll be misled to see that, that we'll be misled like Luther, like justification by faith alone. So our church, Catholic church tells that one side we need faith, another side we need works. But what Paul is telling here is that works according to the law, which the Jews were insisting. So Paul is negating them. So he's telling that we are justified by faith and we need to be clear about that. Thirdly, doctrine about the Holy Spirit, that is pneumatology in theological jargon. So the pneumatology, according to Paul, he differentiates between two. One is world, another one is spirit. Uh, in a way, it talks about the human flesh, flesh and spirit. So they both flesh on the one side and spirit on the other side. And Paul is telling that he in fact creates a new theology of Holy Spirit. So one side, Luke is talking about Holy Spirit, but the real theology, that spirit as the indwelling. Because only because of that, Paul is telling that because of the spirit indwelling in us, we are calling God as Abba, Father. So that is a new dimension as far as the theology is concerned. That way, Paul has contributed to theology of the Holy Spirit. Coming to the fourth one, doctrine of the church or theology of the church, ecclesiology, we call it. Paul has proposed, in fact, mystical body of Christ. So this is a new dimension which has been taken after Second Vatican Council. Even now our Holy Father has initiated this synod on synodality. That is in fact built on this particular metaphor. Like we are all forming one body of Christ. So Christ is the head, we are all his body and we walk together and under his wings we are walking together towards synodality. That's the understanding of Holy Father. But earlier, Prior to this, what was insisted was the church as a perfect society. But Paul never had that idea because when you have that idea, 
you insist on hierarchy, you insist on institutions, but Paul never insisted on that. Paul was insisting only on the mystical body of Christ, and that's a that's a great ecclesiological insight we have from Paul. Finally, doctrine of atonement. Atonement in the sense he takes the concept of atoning. Atoning means sacrificing for somebody else's sins, and he takes that concept applies to the death and resurrection of Jesus, and he tells through this death and resurrection of Jesus, Christ has offered a sacrifice. So that sacrificial element is brought forth only by Paul, not by any other person. So that way, in fact, we can say uh, there existed Jesus of history, but after Paul, he becomes Christ of faith. So one side we have Jesus of history, Christ of faith. So this Christ of faith is born primarily through Paul, we can say. But for Paul, Christianity would not have remained what it is today. So that way Paul has taken theologically the Christianity to the next level. Coming to the world of Paul, like every one of us has a world, like I come from a world, you come from a world, world in that sense of context. So Paul's world could be four dimensional. Number one, Jewish world. Number two, Hellenistic world. Number three, Roman world. Number four, Christian world. So in Paul, all these contexts are all these worlds, worlds lived together. How? Jewish. So Paul uh, takes this concept of monotheism from his Jewish worldview. Then eschatology. Eschatology in the sense the world will come to an end and <coughs> Messiah will come and establish peace. That is eschatology. Anthropology. Anthropology in terms of dualism between body and spirit. So that in fact comes because of the Hellenization, because of the Greek influence that we have in wisdom writing. So Paul might have incorporated that idea from wisdom literature. Then Paul's preaching style, primarily because of his Jewish nature, because of his training under Gamaliel, he might have learned to communicate well and communicate through speeches, communicate through writing. So that way, Paul might have incorporated this skill through his Jewish background. Number two, Hellenistic. Greek. So as I said earlier, Paul knew Greek and not only just the language of Greek, but the rhetoric device. Rhetoric device in the sense, how to make use of a long language for, for not only communicating, but for persuading. So rhetoric act is actually an act of persuasion. Suppose we go to a, a bank, HDFC bank or ICAC bank, there is somebody. So that person's role is actually to persuade us, persuade us to buy a product. So that is a rhetoric style. So that person appeals to the recipients. So suppose I go as, a, as an educated person, he talks to me differently. Suppose I go as a professional, he talks to me differently. That's a rhetoric device. Rhetoric device in the sense, according to a person, you use a technology or use a method of persuasion. And Paul was very good at it. Then dialectic method. Dialectic method is, you, it's like a Socratic method or Aristotelian Plato method we have in Republic. It's a very famous work by Plato. There it is, dialectic style. Dialectic style is one is built on the other. So suppose they are like four friends are working together, means living together, and they just initiate the conversation. What do we understand by politics? Okay, politics is a is the institution of a society. What do you understand by society? Okay, you defend. So that's a, one question builds another question, another question, another question. So if you understand Paul's writing, always he builds on questions. So questions in the sense, where through questions, he indirectly asks the reader to participate in the conversation. So when I ask you a question, actually the other person participates. That's the dialectic method Paul was very good at. And finally, Paul was influenced by Platonian or Platonic philosophy, especially in terms of dualism. Dualism between spirit and flesh. And that has, a, that has impacted Paul so much, especially in the letter to Galatians, we'll see how Paul is ranked by that particular philosophy. The next one, Roman. So as I said, Roman citizenship he had, and he was able to free uh, travel freely, and he enjoyed that Pax Romana, peace of Rome. Finally, Christian influence. He was really a Christian because he encountered the risen Lord. So this is how all these four contexts play in Paul. And Paul's Christian world, we can just elaborate on this because Paul was part of the stoning of Stephen, the first martyr in Christianity. And it's beautifully said by Luke, like when Stephen was being stoned, Paul was 
guarding the clothes so indirectly we can say when paul was guarding the clothes of the opponents in fact god was guarding paul so which paul didn't know that time but later he comes to know that so that's the beauty of god taking paul for a particular purpose and using it for his mission then some words which are very unique to paul which must have been because of his christian real experience number one kerigma kerigma is proclamation so wherever he went he said jesus died for our sins that is the kerigma early church didn't have much theology as we have today their simple faith was this christ died for our sins that proclamation formula is developed by paul secondly maranatha about his eschatology come lord jesus so he in fact waits for the coming of the lord the end of the world and that time it was people were thinking that the end would be very imminent so it would happen immediately but didn't happen and many say it would happen now but still we don't know when it will happen but still that maranatha come lord jesus that waiting is there in paul thirdly messiah so jesus is the messiah because all were expecting messiah that jewish messianic expectation was very high but the jews didn't accept but paul as a jew proclaims that jesus is the messiah that is something beautiful because of his christian influence and paul's hymns especially in the philippians letter to the philippians and letter to the colossians we have beautiful hymns christological hymns and christological hymns are either paul's own invention or communities were using and paul has taken into his own epistles then the use of abba father so jesus has taught this to the disciples but paul also has appropriated this particular title god as abba then institution of the eucharist this is something surprising because paul was not at all present when jesus instituted the eucharist but paul is telling it was handed over to me which means how paul has personalized it eucharist often times we also participate in eucharist but do we really personalize what is in the eucharist but paul is offering a challenge here then passion narratives paul writes as if he participated in the passion narratives of jesus and the creed formula creed formula is christ died for our sins and he rose from the dead and he will come again that we say like the mystery of faith in the eucharistic celebration christ is died christ is risen and christ will come again so this particular formula is developed by paul and that was the profession of faith in the early church so this is the paul's christian world then about his ministry wherever he went paul preached in the local markets synagogues riverside outdoor arena private home public hall and he was imprisoned for his ministry and we always wonder paul could reach out to so many places still paul was imprisoned most of the time so which means even the little time he had when when he was released he would just visit a church or he would found a church so that way all along his life he was only for mission and mission to be the apostle of christ that is the background to paul's life and paul's ministry now let's understand paul's churches so paul's seven church letters we can say like when we come to revelation we'll see how john writes to seven churches here also we have number one rome so we have the letter to the romans then we have number two corinth first letter and second letter to corinthians then number 3 we have galatia galatians number 4 ephesus ephesians then philippi philippians then number 6 colosse colossians then thessalonica thessalonians so here we have other pastoral letters like first timothy second timothy titus so they they were actually bishops here ephesus and crete so paul had written here so these are the seven major churches to whom paul wrote and we can see here the final letter is towards the roman so here so maybe paul necess- did not write necessarily from any one place so he might have written from different places but all these letters were addressed to these seven churches all these seven churches from the geography you see here we have rome on the top then we have colosse at the bottom and we have corinth so here each community has its own background geographical background theological background religious background linguistic background but still paul is able to communicate to all these people that is the beauty of paul because to 
to romans he writes in one way and to corinthians in another way so that way paul is able to communicate good some network issue good are you able to hear me yes father yes, Yes father. Yes, father. Yes, father. yes father yes father yes father thank you we'll continue so we go to the second part religion of paul and his churches so paul's concern like we said earlier here every church has its own specific concerns and paul was addressing those specific situations and how he was addressing through instruction through exhortation instruction in sense you do this way you do that way exhortation is basically a kind of admonishment then advice like he suggests he makes his suggestions then warning like in the uh, in the initial reading we had today paul warns a few people in the churches then he encourages like rejoice support each other so especially the second corinthians is a letter of encouragement amidst suffering so we can always go back to this letter second corinthians whenever we feel discouraged because that particular letter encourages because it portrays the real suffering of paul then at times paul offers temporary solutions or at times permanent solutions that that way he tries to offer solutions to his community problem then conceptual social ritual ethical dimension in the letter we'll come to that shortly number 1 conceptual dimension among all these letters paul handled or paul was talking about some concepts so what are those concepts number 1 is eschatological orientation so everything was oriented towards the second coming that is a parousia the second coming that christ will come again so everything is oriented towards that like especially in the first corinthians 15 we take we take that he is talking about how the world will end how our mortal bodies will be transformed how we will rise again how all those who have died earlier if rise again so that way paul is trying to tell us here then non judaic perspective on the law so the law the judaic law was insisting on circumcision but paul is proposing that we need, we need not have circumcision but instead we need to have faith in jesus and that is the teaching that this concept constantly comes in the writings of paul justification through faith in jesus these are some concepts that repeat the social dimension that we can see in the in the epistles are number 1 house churches like uh, letter to philemon so philemon we have here some call it philemon in american pronunciation so philemon must have owned a house church so when paul writes to him he not only writes to that particular individual but also to the entire household so that way house churches here another thing to notice is <coughs> sorry all social groups were part of it like men and women slaves and masters and all types of groups opponents and the believers so all were participating in house churches then they were members of one body of christ and we have a we have this particular contrast between world culture and christianity because paul is telling that you have to get rid of your old self when you come to christianity so that way the tension between world culture and christianity then leadership issues are there especially in the pastoral letters and role of women so from paul's letters we come to know the women had a key role to play especially in roman 16 3 to 5 we have from here only our holy father takes this insight like early churches some deaconesses were there so we can maybe encourage deaconesses in our own church so that the discussion is or the study is being done because of paul's writing to the roman this is a social world that is reflected in paul the ritual dimension so paul writes about rituals also baptism especially baptism by the holy spirit then he tells that we have to gather on the lord's day that's the common meeting and he talks about lord's supper then about ethical dimension also for paul law primarily means love of neighbor and also he has some negative attitude towards body and sometimes negative attitude towards women we'll see that why he had it really when you come to the letters proper next class then exhortations 
like you be this way, you be that way. That's called in in Greek literary term, it is called parenesis, exhortation or advice giving. So that serves the second part that's about the let the concerns of Pauline churches. So just we quickly see maybe first part we saw Paul and his personal world. Second one, Paul and his ecclesial world. So like in, in all the churches, what were the concerns that needed attention and how these letters address those concerns. That's the second part. Now coming to the third one, it's a very simple one. With this, we'll conclude the first R. Number one, letter writing as a literary genre. So literary genre in the sense, hymn is a literary genre, story, fable is a literary genre, or a simile, metaphor. So there are different types of literary genres in the Bible. One of the literary genres is letter. And these letters form 21 out of 27 New Testament books. So even the book of Revelation is a letter because it is written to seven churches. So that way, then the New Testament, the most part is considered as a letter writing genre. And coming to Old Testament, in the First Testament, do we have real letter writing? Yes, we have. Especially here we have two instances. Number one, where David wants to kill Uriah at the warfare. And what he does, he sends the letter through Uriah. That's a very sad part of it. Maybe Uriah did not know to read and write. So he might not have known what is written in that letter. But still he was carrying that letter. So letter writing was there. And David had written this letter. And in 2 Kings 5, 5 and 6, we have Naaman. Naaman coming to Elisha. So he gets a letter and the letter is presented to the king of Syria. And looking at the letter, uh, the Syrian, Syrian king gives a letter. And looking at that, Israelite king becomes upset. Am I a god? He is asking. So letter writing was very common in the First Testament as well. And what would be the format of the letters? Like we have in our own letter writing as well. We have formal letter, informal letter. Like we have studied in school, formal letter writing, informal letter writing. Formal is for a official purpose, professional purpose, and informal is for a casual or personal relationship. But when it comes to the epistles in the Bible, what we have is four elements are there. Number one, opening formula, like he starts with a greeting. Secondly, thanksgiving. Thanksgiving in the sense, I thank God for all of you, or I thank God for all the good things that has happened. So there is a positive note. Thirdly, the body of the letter message. Then a concluding formula. You pass my wishes to this person, that person, or I would come that way. I, or he come in like in the initial reading we had, Paul is writing to Timothy that you bring the clock when you come next time. You bring the parchments. So these are like concluding things, some practical information he wants to give. These four elements are present in the Greco-Roman letter writing. And letter writing as an art. So materials used must be papyrus with a reed stick. So they say, the scholars who analyze these letters, they say, well, we can write only three letters. Three letters is three alphabets per minute, which means for one alphabet, it would take about 20 seconds. So which means they have to take the reed, sharpen the reed, and put it in the bottle, ink bottle, then take it out before it dries, and they have to make an impression on the script, on the parchment. Our parchment could be papyrus, our parchment could be bellum. Bellum is from animal skin. That would be like, it will be smooth writing. It will be like we write on a, with a ballpoint pen. But the papyrus would be really difficult because uh, it will absorb the ink first. Then they have to calculate accordingly. And also ink, that should not be diluted much and that should not be very thick. If it's very thick, it won't stick on the paper. If it's diluted, it will disappear. So very minutely, they had to work out the ink also. So a lot of effort they might have put. And that's why scholars say, for, for in an hour, we can write only 72 words. And suppose there is a mistake, or suppose there is uh, some ink spilt on the paper, they have to change it, and really the work will be difficult. So they say for first Thessalonians, Paul might have taken 20 real hours to prepare this, which means Paul might have prepared the parchment, prepared the ink, then slowly he might have written. So this is the difficulty Paul might have had in writing letter. Then continuity and discontinuity. Like as we write today, suppose I write a book or I write a letter, so I write this morning and I continuously I finish it. That is the continuity. 
but paul didn't do that way like he would have begun the uh, text today so suddenly tomorrow uh, ship will depart for another place so paul had to rush and in the ship paul couldn't ride so what he will do he will just carry so it will take two or three months then after that he will continue so what would be the problem is when we continue after a long time either we tend to contradict or we tend to repeat suppose i begin a book or begin a write like writing a book so i write one paragraph or one pages today i stop the work for three months then after three months i resume the work so that time either i will repeat what i have written earlier because i have forgotten that it has been written but even now with the word processing we can always go back but not earlier or i would contradict so what i said earlier i would be contradicting today so that is the problem but still that's why we have in many places repetition so one place paul will tell then again the same thing will be retold in another place which means paul that's we didn't understand that it was not written at a it a, at a con subsequent level so it, paul had its own pauses then who wrote it really some letters were written by paul himself own hand some dictation so like paul will be there somebody else scribe will be there he will dictate and the other person will write that is dictation third one is theme dictation theme dictation is suppose we have a holy father or we have a bishop or archbishop so what they call they just call the secretary like so holy father does not write the document maybe preparatory document for synod so he tells the theme okay this is the synod on synodality i want these many themes to be discussed so what the scholars team they will work together and they will present to him and the holy father will sign and affix a signature and will pass on so that is how theme dictation works but the last one is delegation delegation in the sense the one who delegates not even declares that so he does not know he just tells write a letter to so and so and the other person writes so as far as our letters are concerned either they might have been one sworn hand and dictation the theme dictation we have in hebrews so hebrews they say it must have been theme dictation and from romans 16:22 we come to know that paul also had a secretary who would write that by, by name tertius i think he might have been a learned person who would translate paul's thoughts but we stop here it's 4:45 49 so we'll resume at 5 o'clock and we'll conclude at 5:45 so you may stay back or you may take a break and come.